Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started with the webinar in just a minute. Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am the Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. Um, I'm very pleased all of you could be with us here today. And we're, we're particularly pleased to have Carolyn Kowski here. Carolyn is the Associate Vice President for Economics and Policy at the Environmental Defense Fund. And she's gonna be presenting today about understanding disaster insurance, new tools for a more resilient future. This is the title of Carolyn's new book that's just come out with Island Press. And in a few minutes, I'll be posting uh, in the chat, uh, the link to the book and a discount for anybody who attends this webinar. Um, and she'll be telling us uh, some of really pertinent information from the book, but I imagine there's a lot more we won't be able to cover in this hour. So um, I'd highly recommend uh, checking out Carolyn's book. And um, before we get started, what we're going to do for this webinar um, is Karen will give an initial presentation, and then we will do question and answers, uh, which I'll moderate. So you can send in questions for Carolyn either through the Q and A uh, panel in the in the user interface or through the chat panel. And we've actually enabled the chat so that um, participants can chat freely with each other and with us. Um, and so we just ask um, you are. Um, welcome and encouraged to send relevant information through the chat. We just uh, request that you use it professionally. Um, Carolyn, I will turn it over to you if you want to go ahead and share your presentation. Yeah, great. Thank okay. you. And thanks so much for the invitation to be with you today. Um, let me share my screen and we can jump right in. Okay. All right, I assume that's looking good, um, or Sarah will jump in and it, tell me if it's It not. looks good. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it looks yeah. great. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, yeah, so again, wonderful to be with all of you. And as Sarah said, I'm going to talk about some themes from my new book, and I'm going to focus in um, on looking at some innovations happening in insurance markets to help improve the way insurance works and help meet social and environmental goals. So let me give you kind of a quick outline of where we're headed today. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a bit about the role of disaster insurance in recovery. That's the primary role of insurance is to help recover from these types of events. And yet, we're also seeing that disaster insurance markets aren't fully meeting everyone's needs right now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the shortcomings that we're seeing in disaster insurance markets. And some of those are um, driven by fundamental challenges in insuring disasters. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then with all that as background, I want to then shift in the second half of the presentation to talk about some innovations that we're seeing first that kind of center the needs of people that try to promote greater equity and close um, insurance gaps and make the financial resources of insurance available to more people. And then I want to talk about how insurance can be used to help promote um, conservation and restoration and other environmental goals and really promote nature positive activity. So that's where we'll end up. So that's where we're headed. So let's jump right in and start by talking about the role of disaster insurance. So as we all know, the costs from climate related disasters are going up. Most of the data we have on disaster losses, like the data you see here from NOAA, is focused on direct property damage because that's the easiest to collect and measure. But I do want to stress that when we're talking about financial recovery from climate disasters, we're talking about, yes, a lot of property damage, but also more than that. Disasters can cause a large range of economic impacts. And that's why I tend to think of disasters as these negative financial shocks to households, to businesses, and communities. There are times when expenditures have to go way up to repair and rebuild that property damage to homes, buildings, and contents, but also all these other types of disaster-related expenses that you see here. And this is drawing on some recent survey work that colleagues and I have done 
uh, uh, looking at the financial recovery of households after some um, of the major hurricanes that have hit the US in recent years. And we see that after disasters, households also face a number of costs, like cleaning up all the debris and buying lots of um, preparedness and recovery supplies, having to pay for fuel or generators if the grid is down, temporary housing, both um, evacuation costs and during rebuilding, um, and so forth and so on. You know, higher transportation costs when, when in transit infrastructure is down. So there's all these expenditures that households face in the aftermath of a disaster. And also it can be time when incomes decline because disasters can really interrupt businesses. And we see that um, about 40% of respondents to this particular survey reported that they had a decline in income associated with the disaster event as well. So we see this increase in expenditures, a decrease in income. So how do households cope with this type of financial shock? Karen, and there's, if you could slow down just a hair. Sorry, I do yeah. tend to talk too okay. bad. Yeah. <laughs> so with that type of financial shock, we know that there's really four buckets of types of funding or financing that households can draw on to cover all those costs that they face. So the first is savings. Households can and do deplete their savings accounts in order to cover the disaster costs and rebuild. But we also know that many households do not have enough liquid savings to cover the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars that a disaster event, a severe disaster can impose on a household. We also know that if households have to deplete any savings that they've built up for retirement or their kids' education, they're in a much greater sort of in a more financially precarious situation after the disaster event. So without sufficient savings to cover costs, households could look at taking out a loan and access to credit is an important source of being able to finance recovery for many households. But we also know that low and moderate income households often can't make use of post-disaster loans. We've looked at disaster loan data and lower income households are often locked out of access to credit altogether because they don't meet basic debt to income or credit score requirements or and other households, even if they could get a loan, might not really have the resources to be able to repay that over time. So loans can be important, but are limited in the population they serve. Another source you might think is assistance from the government. And after a presidentially declared disaster, FEMA does offer grants to impacted households, but these are only a few thousand dollars. They are not designed to make people financially whole after a disaster event. They're only there to kind of cover some immediate needs and keep people and make their house safe. So that means they can be helpful, but they don't come close to covering the types of costs that households sustain. We also know that other types of federal assistance can take a very long time to get to people, um, not just months, but literally years after the disaster event. So the bottom line with federal aid is that it's inadequate and uh, takes too long. And so that leaves insurance, which is exactly designed for this type of situation to be an infusion of funds. But we also know, and we'll talk about this, that disaster insurance can be expensive and many households can't afford it. So you can see the challenge in trying to rebuild and also the real equity dimension here because it's a lower income households that struggle with access to all of these. And it makes their recovery much, much harder than that for more affluent households. Households. So given the limitations in the first three, savings, loan, and assistance, that's why there's a growing body of research that households with insurance tend to recover better and recover faster than households without insurance. We see that households that have insurance coverage are more likely to rebuild and they have better financial outcomes after a disaster event because it makes available those funds they need. In that survey work I mentioned earlier, we were also looking at what happens when households don't have insurance. And what we find is that when households don't have insurance, they often have to engage in really costly coping mechanisms. So they have to do other things in order to meet those disaster costs. They might have to sell some of their belongings. They have to cut back spending on important things like medical care. Um, they might fall behind on their mortgage or other bills. But when we have insurance, it can protect against having to do all those things that have real short-term and long-term costs on a household. So all of that kind of motivates why disaster insurance is important and of increasing importance as climate change is increasing the kind of uh, extreme events that we face. So, but that all said, <laughs> we still know that um, 
it's not quite doing the best job of this right now. So the primary job of insurance, as I already talked about, is this financial recovery. And we're going to talk at the end about how to harness insurance to do a lot more than that, right? To help reduce losses ahead of time and protect nature, and we'll get there. But first, insurance really needs to at least do recovery well. But there's lots of signs that right now it's really struggling at this task. And so I want to talk about some of those current problems and then turn into how we kind of fix them. So the first big challenge is that lots of people don't have disaster insurance at all. And this is true globally. Swiss Re, a large reinsurance company, estimates that about two thirds of direct costs from natural disasters worldwide are uninsured. Even in a place like the United States with very well-developed insurance markets, we still see a big gap. Lots of people exposed to disasters who don't have any coverage for it. So for the US context, let's look a little closer at why that is. So in the United States, most homeowners, roughly 85%, have a standard homeowner's insurance policy. This is required by a bank if you have a lender and many households keep it uh, even if um, their home is fully paid off. This covers a range of bad things that might happen to your house, um, but not all bad things. And that's the challenge when it comes to disasters. So we know that these standard property policies completely exclude flood damage, for example. I'm focused here on climate disasters, but I just wanted to also note that they exclude earthquakes. So large classes of disasters are just not covered at all in standard homeowners insurance policies. And sometimes consumers might not be aware of that. We also know that even for disasters that are still typically included in homeowners insurance, um, like wind damage, so it's also maybe not fully appreciated that there is no such thing as hurricane insurance in the United States. You have to have both wind coverage and flood coverage for the storm surge or flooding from the intense precipitation. So you have to have these two coverages. The flood's not included. The wind is still in your homeowners insurance. But we also know when that wind is from hurricanes, that more of those costs go back on the homeowner. So every coastal state exposed to hurricanes has what's called hurricane deductibles um, in, in typical homeowner's insurance policies, which just means that if the damage to your home is from a named storm, the homeowner has to pay a much higher share of those losses than otherwise. And we see this with a lot of disasters that a larger share of the costs fall back on the consumer. So we're also seeing, for example, increasing reports of things like sublimates. So that means this was a an issue that was reported on after the Texas ice storm that um, a number of households had burst pipes, but found out that their insurance had a sublimit, which means even if you have $300,000 of insurance coverage for a burst pipe, they'll only give you 2,000, even if the damage was 10,000, right? And so all these types of things um, combine so that after a disaster, often consumers who thought they had protection actually don't and don't have the financial resources they need. Now, I noted at the beginning, um, and this is kind of really relevant for coastal areas, that floods are excluded from homeowners insurance. So to get flood coverage, you have to buy a separate flood policy. And while there's a small private market, most of that is offered through the federal flood insurance program. But we also know that lots of people at risk of flooding don't have a separate flood insurance policy. This map shows you estimates of the take-up rate, so that's the share of households in the FEMA-mapped floodplain that have a flood insurance policy. So these are not countywide take-up rates. They're take-up rates for um, that specific area that FEMA maps as high risk. And you can see that, again, along the hurricane-prone coast, take-up rates are pretty good. They're often in excess of 60, even sometimes in excess of 80%. But as you get to inland floodplains, take-up rate plummets. And we see that in a lot of the country, in inland floodplains, take-up rate is less than 20%. So lots of people at risk who don't have the protection of flood insurance. So why is that? And the challenge is that there's lots of reasons for that. One, and we could spend a whole talk just on this, is that we don't do a very good job in this country about communicating about flood risk. There's limitations with those FEMA maps, with disclosure. We just don't do a really good job of making sure that people know, particularly before they move in somewhere, what that flood risk is and what it means for them financially. So that can lead people to not insure because they don't fully appreciate the risk. We also know that people are pretty bad at thinking about risks and probabilities. There's a lot of behavioral economics and psychology research on exactly this point, and that they're often prone to a lot of what are referred to as decision biases. For example, people tend to be overly optimistic and think that disasters are something that happened to other people and not to them. But if you're kind of overly optimistic, that leads you to underprepare and perhaps not buy flood insurance. 
But a really big driver of the lack of flood insurance is the cost. So disaster insurance can be expensive and lots of people simply can't afford it or don't think it's worth it. So I now wanna take a little aside on talking about why disaster insurance can be so expensive. This is gonna get slightly technical for one minute and then we'll kind of move back on. Um, but I just wanna note that um, the foundation of insurance is risk pooling. So that's the idea of sharing risks in a group. So everybody, for example, makes a small contribution to a fund. When something bad happens to one of the people, they get to take the money. In another year, something bad happens to someone else, they take the money. That's the kind of basic concept, and it's formalized in insurance, where your regular contribution is your premium payment that you pay every year. And then when something bad happens to you, that's when you get your claim payment. And that bundling together of risks, bringing everyone's risks together, is this enormously powerful tool that has built the modern insurance industry. And we don't need to get into it in detail, but when you pull independent risks like that together, what happens is you don't change the expected loss that anyone faces, but the losses become much more predictable. You reduce uncertainty. And most importantly, you reduce the chance of a really, really severe loss across the whole pool. So that's what makes insurance possible. The challenge, though, is that disasters don't obey those laws. So not all risks can be insured. And economists have come up with this list of ideal criteria to make insurance possible. And we're not gonna talk about all of them today, but we're gonna highlight that one, that disasters don't follow this nice pattern. They're correlated, which means when something bad happens to you, it also happens to your neighbors. So when you get in a car accident, it doesn't mean all your neighbors got in a car accident, but when you suffer through a hurricane, a big flood, all your neighbors did too, right? And those risks and those damages can be really, really bad. That all means that when you look at losses over time from disasters, they get really spiky. And that's what I'm showing here. This is from New York City because we have a project in New York right now. Um, but, but it's just exemplary of this pattern that with disasters, you have lots of quiet years, nothing bad's happening. Then a huge year where there's enormous costs, right? That doesn't happen when you look at something like auto insurance, right? So car damages, car crashes, pretty stable year to year. Every year, some people get in a car accident. You know, there's some amount of damages. Next year, it's different people, but those losses are pretty stable, but not with disasters. It's kind of low and then huge spike. Now, why does that matter? Insurance companies have to have access to money to pay all those huge claims in a disaster year without going bankrupt. And there's a number of ways they can do that. They have their equivalent of savings. They have their equivalent of insurance called reinsurance. Um, they have financial instruments but none of that is free and it gets passed on to the insured. So this whole aside was just to make the point that disaster insurance because of that can be more expensive and often people can't afford it. And if insurance can't be offered at a price that um, you know, people will buy it, the market breaks down. And what we've seen is a lot of government intervention in the United States and around the world. In fact, there's nowhere where there's a well-functioning disaster insurance market with lots of people buying the insurance without government intervention. These interventions take a lot of forms we're not going to talk about them today. I just wanted to stress that when we're talking about disaster insurance, we're not just talking about private market dynamics. We're talking about public policy choices about how to distribute the cost of disasters. And we'll come back to that. So this was, to step back for a second, what we were just talking about was one of the biggest challenges with disasters, uh, with disaster insurance, and, the, and a reason why people might not have it. It's expensive to provide, the private sector can't always do it, and it costs a lot. We also see some other challenges with recovery from disasters. So um, people often complain a lot about their insurance company. Maybe you've wanted to complain about your insurance company too, if you've had to deal with them. And this is some data from the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And we find for homeowners insurance, and you see that people are often frustrated with the claims experience. They are the number one bar. I don't know if you can see it, but that top bar there is concerned about delays. It takes too long. Um, and then there's a lot of claims about not getting the money they were supposed to um, and poor customer service. And this kind of points to this other conversation that's been kind of brewing around disaster insurance and insurance more broadly, um, which is well summarized by the CEO of this new insurance company, not quite as new anymore, but called Lemonade. And he called attention to the fact that there's this profound conflict of interest at the core of the insurance business model. So you pay your premium into the insurance company, expecting them to give you your claims payment. But at that moment, when they're coming to pay your claim, every dollar they give you is a dollar less profit.
So they have this real financial incentive to limit the amount they pay out, right? Um, and so Lemonade <laughs> kind of said, we need a totally different model that doesn't have perverse incentives like that. And so they've designed an insurance company where they just take a set amount for their operating costs. And then what's not paid for claims gets donated to charities that their customers choose. So it's a very different model. But we're going to come to some other types of new models um, when we talk about using insurance for more nature positive outcomes. Okay, so to take stock of where we are. <laughs> Disaster insurance is really important for people's recovery, and yet we're facing some challenges with people not having access, um, not being able to afford it, not having it meet their needs. So now let's move into what we can do about this to make um, recoveries better and really center people and their needs to make insurance work for them. So there's a bunch of new models that are emerging in this vein, and there's two bits of background information I want to give you before sharing some of them. The first is that it's important to note that insurance can be purchased at all scales. The standard kind of model is what we're used to here. Homeowners insurance, auto insurance, medical insurance. It's for you as the person, right? Or for your home. But insurance can be, and we'll talk about this, offered at much smaller scales or shorter duration. Standard insurance contracts are for a year all the way up to sovereign insurance, which is insurance for countries. So for example, in several parts of the world, like in the Caribbean and some Latin American countries, um, the countries have gotten together and have insurance for themselves against disaster. So if a severe hurricane hits a Caribbean island, for example, this insurance will pay them to help them jumpstart their recovery. So we can have insurance you know, from these very tiny policies all the way up to policies for entire countries. I'm gonna talk about the micro and meso models uh, briefly now. Both of them draw on something called parametric insurance. So this is another um, kind of term to understand before, before looking at these new models. So the first thing to note is that our standard insurance that you're used to, your homeowner's insurance, again, as an example, is what's referred to as indemnity insurance. So that means the payout is directly related to the damage you sustain. A tree falls on your house, a loss adjuster, an actual person comes, looks at the loss, pays you the cost. With parametric insurance, the payout is instead related to an observable metric of the hazard itself. So you'll get a set amount when wind speeds exceed some threshold within so many miles of your house, for example. Now, this type of insurance can't replace our standard homeowner's insurance, but it does open up a new tool to address some unmet needs right now and um, to bring insurance to some populations that are currently struggling to have access to that financial protection. And that's because of two things. One, it's very fast. The payout can be made in a matter of days. That's not typical for regular insurance, which can take weeks um, to months to adjust the loss and get payouts to people. It also has much faster transaction costs because you don't have to send actual loss adjusters. You just look at this um, third party observable metric, the trigger, and then you make payout. So how has that been used? The one, uh, first I wanted to highlight micro insurance. This is a tool that's been becoming um, more popular globally. They are smaller coverage policies with much lower premiums, typically designed for lower income populations. And they have to be parametric in order to have lower transaction costs to make them affordable and to make it easy to get payouts um, into communities that might be harder to access. So they're fast and flexible, smaller amounts of dollars. Um, it's new to the US market though. While that's been used globally, it's new to the US. Puerto Rico so far is the only jurisdiction to have created enabling regulations for a micro insurance market. And the first micro insurance policies paid out just recently after Hurricane Fiona. This idea of micro insurance um, globally has really been used to bring some amount of financial resources to households that had no insurance. But because the dollars are so flexible, we can also think about other ways to use these type of micro policies. For example, they could be used to create, to cover very immediate needs. So we know aid and insurance and loans can take weeks or months to get to people. These could be paid immediately to cover those very acute post-disaster expenses. It could be used for things like evacuation expenses or temporary housing. It might be a better policy tailored to the needs of renters or mobile homeowners, and it can also be used for things like to compensate for lost income. So there's a range of uh, sort of niches that microinsurance might fill in the U.S. The other different type of model I wanted to mention was mesoinsurance, sometimes often referred to as an aggregator model. 
In these models, there's another organization that sits between the insurance company and the individuals. And the idea here is that this institution is typically the one either purchasing insurance and then passing the payouts down to people or arranging the insurance contracts. And this can take a number of different forms. So for example, we've seen lots of use of this by like credit unions where they attach a micro insurance policy to their loans so that if a disaster happens, people's loans are forgiven or they get a cash infusion. And that's done automatically by the kind of intermediary institution here. We're also seeing interest in community groups, local governments, nonprofits play this role of helping um, establish um, financial assistance for households that wouldn't have it. Um, putting the institution in between the household and the insurance can help broadly um, and dramatically expand take-up rates and also reduce the burden on households of having to engage in the insurance market and also minimize the risk associated with parametric policies that the payout might not exactly match need by having the institution in between um, assign the dollars to, to the highest need. I'm working with a nonprofit in New York City right now on piloting just such a model. So we can talk about that more if anyone's interested. So these are the types of new designs that are kind of being tested right now to see if we can get the financial protection of insurance to those who need it the most and who haven't been able to afford it to date. There's another interesting innovation I want to highlight, which is the idea of turning disaster insurance completely on its head and using it to prevent disasters in the first place. So insurance is typically supposed to compensate you for a loss after the fact, right? But what if it could prevent that loss in the first place? There's not very many examples of this kind of thinking, but one that's held up as an example that I want to share with you because I think it's this type of change in thinking that might be really helpful as we face escalating climate extremes. Um, it's called the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program. And this was set up to prevent the negative impacts associated with drought in Kenya and Ethiopia. It is targeted at pastoralists whose animals can die of starvation during a drought. And indeed, drought is one of the leading causes of livestock death uh, for these pastoralists. The way this program works is that satellite data is used to detect the onset of drought. So this is that parametric trigger. So in the satellite data, um, indicates that drought uh, is becoming more severe, then payments are made to these pastoralists so that they can buy food and water for their livestock to prevent the livestock from dying. So instead of insurance compensating them for the loss, which would the typical model would be the livestock dies, then you get compensated for it. Instead, we're gonna kind of save the livestock in the first place. Um, I. I really like this model and for a couple other reasons besides how important it is to you know, try to reduce losses ahead of time. One is that to work well, you have to integrate the insurance with other aspects of disaster risk management. So for this program to be successful, there also has to be you know, a good supply chain and government program to make sure that that food and water is available to the pastoralists to help their animals, right? Um, and when we see in a number of contexts that when you integrate the sort of insurance piece with the other aspects of risk management, the overall um, policy approach can be more impactful. I also want to highlight, and this is true across all the types of uh, interventions I've been talking about so far today, that often they require support from the public sector or from philanthropy. So some of the models we looked at, the mesoinsurance and the microinsurance models, are designed to reduce the cost of insurance so that more people can afford it. But it's often the case that there is still a population that we want to help who has no disposable dollars to spend on insurance, who needs every dollar to meet immediate needs, and yet they often would benefit the most from the sort of financial safety net that insurance provides. And so we've seen globally that lots of times governments or foundations step in and subsidize the cost of insurance for those um, households that are, um, you know, the most low income households. And that's the case in this program too, this Kenya program, where about half the pastoralists are purchasing it on their own and some of the lowest income ones, um, the government is supporting the cost of the insurance for them. Okay, the last section here, the last thing I wanted to talk through uh, before we open it up for, for discussion and questions, was some of the um, innovations that have been going on, on around how to make insurance helpful in supporting nature positive activities as we face, you know, not just the climate crisis, but a biodiversity crisis as well. So there are three approaches I want to talk through. The first is reflecting the protection that nature can provide in 
the premiums and the cost of insurance. The second is insuring natural capital itself. This has um, only been done for coral reefs, and we'll talk through that example and whether or how um, it might be able to be expanded. And then some sort of more novel approaches to insurance and underwriting and investment. Uh, so let's just quickly go through, uh, well, in a few minutes, go through all of these, and then we'll have some questions. Okay. So the first one is having property insurance reflect the benefits of nature. So we know that some natural systems reduce disaster risk. Wetlands can store floodwaters, mangroves can buffer storm surge, slopes can be stabilized, you know, with vegetation to prevent mudslides. Certain ecological forestry practices can reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire. And if the cost of insurance reflects the underlying risk, then in theory, if a natural system is lowering disaster risks for a property, the cost of insurance should be lower as well, you know, reflecting this benefit. Um, but for such pricing to actually incentivize new investments in conservation and restoration, there's a few challenges that need to be overcome. The first is that the insurance industry has to have sound models that quantify the benefits from nature, not just at a high level, like we know wetlands store floodwaters, but at a property level. So the wetlands are storing the floodwaters, but what does that mean for reduced likelihood or magnitude of flood claims at this specific property? That's a whole nother level um, of detail, and it's been difficult to achieve. There's models out there, but a lot of them aren't quite fully advanced enough for insurers to be really comfortable in using them to provide, you know, serious discounts um, in premiums at a property level. The second challenge is an institutional one. It's difficult to harness the small premiums, the small premium reductions we might see from investment in a nature-based solution in order to take those reductions and use them to finance new investments in nature, right? So if we um, invest, again, let's use the example of wetlands to store floodwaters, that might lower flood risk for a whole bunch of properties. All of those properties might get a small reduction on their insurance premium, but in order to do more wetland conservation, um, conservationists are trying to figure out how you take all those small premium reductions and turn them into a flow of funding that can be invested in expanded conservation. And that's really hard because they're across all different companies and all different properties. Um, and so it's a little bit of an institutional challenge. One approach is for local governments to take out a bond to pay for increased investment in nature-based solutions that would lower risk and then assess property owners a fee to cover that debt servicing with the idea being that yes, they'd pay this extra fee, but they'd also see a reduction in their premiums and it would be a wash at the household level. But it's really hard to make that actually work. Insurers um, don't want to guarantee any types of price reductions or um, have multi-year price guarantees. Um, and with different companies and different types of insurance coverage, it's just difficult to, you know, have that line up perfectly. So there'd have to be some political will to do this, even without that uh, being able to match perfectly. Another approach that's being talked about is something called community insurance, where communities might buy insurance on behalf of all their residents. That's been talked about. It's a very interesting idea, but hasn't actually happened in practice yet. Um, but the idea would be that if the community was purchasing the insurance, then the premium reduction for investment in community level um, nature-based solutions would be substantial enough to drive um, those greater investments. So great idea, still have some institutional kinks uh, to work out to make it actually promote greater investments um, in nature. Okay, the second thing was ensuring a natural asset itself. And I'm sure some of you listening have read about the coral reef insurance policies um, that have been happening over the last few years. So the first one was for the Mesoamerican reef, which stretches along four countries from Mexico to Honduras. It's the largest barrier reef in the Western hemisphere and it's really valuable, right? It's a tourist attraction. It supports the economy of many coastal communities. It's habitat for many species. It supports fishing and provides livelihood to coastal residents. It can reduce wave energy and you know, protection to the coastal development. Yet corals are under threat. I'm sure most people listening know that half of the world's co corals have already been lost since the 1950s. Scientists estimate that 90% are gonna be gone this century. 
Now, those threats are largely from things like climate change and pollution, but very strong storms can also damage reefs. They can break off coral. And if those pieces fall into rubble from the storm, they might not be able to regrow. But if you send divers in, like in the picture there, right after the storm, they can reattach the coral and help it um, repair itself and grow back and not have as much sustained damage from the storm. So how do you pay for that? Well, a novel approach to financing that was pioneered in Mexico, where a whole group of um, uh, many groups who care about the protection of the reef, so hotel owners, the local government, the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Commission, Swiss Re, the big reinsurance company, got together and they created a trust to help protect the beach and the reef. And one thing the trust did was purchase a parametric insurance policy that they would get a payout when a big hurricane happened. Well, that policy was tested with Hurricane Delta in 2020 and the trust got $800,000 to pay for divers and boats to go out and begin these repair work to reattach the corals. That's now been um, replicated um, further down the reef and I think also recently in Hawaii. It hasn't really been replicated to other systems though. And I think there's a few reasons why that we need to think about. Um, the first is that Natural systems are what economists call public goods, right? Everybody benefits from them. And so nobody really has an incentive to pay for their protection. And the same thing is true about insuring them. So what I think was actually really innovative about the Mexico example was less the parametric product and more the institution that got all the groups that benefit from a healthy reef together to all contribute and work together in maintaining that reef. And so that type of institutional work has to be done before you kind of can take out the insurance policy because Otherwise, people, you know, point fingers and want somebody else to pay for it, kind of a classic public goods problem. But when we think about replica replicability, there's also some other things we need to think about. The first is that some ecosystems after big disasters don't need intervention. They're best left on their own to heal themselves. So we need to identify those ecological systems where something like having these divers go in, something that requires money, because insurance is about money after the fact, right, um, would actually support important work to help repair uh, the system. And then I also, well, yeah, two, two more points. The first is to highlight insurance isn't free, right? You have to pay that premium. And sometimes it's not cost effective to transfer premium to a private insurance company. Sometimes it might be better for a trust like that to hold the money in a savings account accruing interest and then have it there to make the payments themselves to the divers when they need to. And so that's a balance that has to be made for each context about how much the insurance costs, how much savings they have, how much money they're gonna need for repairs, right? And that's true for any insurance. There's times where it's really cost-effective and very important to have that smoothing mechanism of insurance and other types of risks, it's much cheaper just to cover on your own. And the final point I want to make is that, and I think this is really important when we get to these kind of um, the intersection of insurance and nature is that there are some problems that insurance can really help solve and there are some that it really can't. And it's important to identify the places where it can't too, right? To know where this is a helpful tool. And one of the biggest challenges for coral reefs is around climate change. It's ocean warming and ocean acidification and insurance cannot help with those threats. And that's what's really leading to the dramatic decline in corals. And so these repairs after a hurricane are helpful, but they're not going to stem that huge loss that we're facing associated with climate change. Okay. Um, next one, number three, is looking at new risk transfer approaches. Um, so the point here is that lots of types of environmental activities require pretty standard insurance. So let's back up for one second to give a good example. So over 95% of the protected land in the U.S. is owned by government, but a growing number of stakeholders are highlighting that greater conservation on private lands, which is the majority of land in the U.S., is going to be needed <clears throat> to address the declines in plant and animal populations that we're seeing, and land trusts play a critical role in that, right? They um, hold easements and fee simple lands um, in conservation status, but they have to protect those sometimes against legal challenges. And a legal case in the late 1990s that required a conservation organization to pay out lots of money to defend an easement alerted the land trust community to this risk. And many realized that without insurance coverage, a really bad legal case could bankrupt them. And this seems like a situation that's perfect for insurance, right? Rare, but potentially catastrophic financial risk. That's what insurance is designed for. But land trusts were unable to find commercial insurance policies to give them the protection they needed at a price point that they could really afford. And part of the problem was that standard insurance 
didn't really understand these risks and saw the potential customer pool as very small and so didn't invest in understanding them. And when traditional insurers aren't familiar with a risk profile, they tend to charge a lot more for it, more than the land trust could pay. So in order to overcome these challenges, um, the Land Trust Alliance created Terra Firmer, um, which is a, uh, organ an insurance organization, but its structure is, I think, unique in the world. It's a charitable risk pool, which means it's a nonprofit, um, and it's a captive, which means an captive is an insurance provider completely owned by the members to whom it provides insurance. They're sometimes used by, uh, like utilities have a captive that provides insurance only to utilities and is owned by them. So this is a nonprofit captive. So it's only for land trust, um, land trust, and it also provides them with um, other risk management services as well. In 2020, it offered this kind of defense liability insurance policies to hundreds of land trusts um, across the U.S. And I think the success of this highlights how innovations and in how we actually structure risk transfer. So we don't need standard insurance companies to help with the pooling and transfer of risk. And that can help meet the needs of sort of niche um, uh, products and institutions to help them with the risk management that they need. Okay, let's now turn to uh, um, one. I have a, just a couple more slides and then we'll be done here looking ahead. Um, I wanted to talk about one other sort of niche thing. So we could have these novel business models, but we also can have novel products and novel brokers helping with it. So let me give examples because I think examples make all this much clearer. So groups that do ecological restoration or manage lands for recreation also need a bunch of insurance, right? They need workers' compensation and they need liability and auto coverage and all these things, right? Um, but similar to the land trust, many of these groups were finding that insurers didn't have the expertise and it was cost prohibitive to get these coverages for them. So um, a few years ago, two folks, an insurance broker and a conservation specialist, a founder of a group that had been working to connect young people to work experiences in restoration and conservation, teamed up and created Conservation United, which is an insurance broker, which means someone who helps you find insurance coverage, designed specifically for folks working in conservation and restoration to help them with all the standard insurance they need, but understanding the risk and so offering them much more affordable prices for that. Um, and so they've saved a lot of, um, they've saved many uh, environmental groups a lot of money in, in those um, insurance purchases. They've also started developing some novel products too. So things like, um, ensuring wetland mitigation banking and carbon offsets. So as we see the emergence of environmental markets, we're also seeing the emergence of the risk management tools to go along with it. Um, okay, two more slides and then we'll be ready for questions. Um, I wanna talk about underwriting and investing. So underwriting. Underwriting is the process by which insurance companies evaluate the risks they take and whether they wanna insure them and if they do, how much they're gonna charge. Through this process, insurers can actually choose to insure or not insure things, right, and have an impact on environmental outcomes. This um, kind of lever of using underwriting has been getting a lot of attention around climate policy. And so insurers have been being pressured by a number of activists to make pledges that, for example, they won't insure any new coal because there is no room for new coal in a, in a Paris aligned future um, and to make similar types of pledges on other types of oil and gas and carbon intensive sectors. And indeed the UN has pulled some of this together through the net zero insurance alliance. But thinking about underwriting for more nature positive activities is still pretty new. And it could take a number of forms, right? It could be insurance companies refusing to insure sectors, firms, or projects that have really negative impacts on the environment. It could be saying, we're only going to insure you if you undertake these important measures to reduce your environmental footprint. It could be charging higher prices for things like liability coverage for environmentally harmful activities because there is then a higher risk of um, lawsuits against them. So this is all kind of coming together under a lot of new conversations about what role uh, underwriting decisions can have in conservation, in climate, um, and part of the broader ESG conversations around insurance. Okay, the very last one I want to mention is that insurance companies, 
I was talking earlier about how they have to have access to money to pay all these huge claims, right? So because of that, they are large holders of capital. They have a lot of money just sitting there because they needed to just sit there so that they can access it really quickly if they need to pay claims. So in general, they need to put their capital in safe and more liquid types of investments. But again, paralleling the climate conversations, there's been a lot of pressure that insurance companies, since they do have so much capital, start taking a climate lens to that and divest from carbon intensive firms um, and also proactively invest in things like renewables. But we're also seeing an emerging conversation similar to that divestment conversation around nature positive activities. So different types of screens on what types of investments um, should be excluded because they're harmful or should be included because they're helpful. I'll say sort of merging the investment and philanthropy aspects of insurance too. There's a very interesting uh, new model that has emerged in Canada where a team of Canadian insurers teamed up with Ducks Unlimited to actually fund investments in expanded wetlands near urban areas in order to promote sort of nature-based solutions um, around areas where they were insuring property. So I think there's even further uh, innovations to be had in how we can um, unite some of these things um, for greater environmental protection. Okay, so that's everything I had. I think that's left us with at least 15 minutes for questions. Um, so let me stop sharing now um, and I'll turn it, um, Sarah, back over to you to kind of moderate any discussion that we now wanna have. Okay, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, this was fabulous. It's, it's great to get the primer on how insurance works and then uh, more details about um, uh, how it can be an environmentally positive aspect. Um, we had a couple questions that came in sort of mid presentation, which I'd like to cover. And then um, some more that came in. I just remind everyone, you can go ahead and send in questions either in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, I was also going to note, I just saw something last week that Hawaii got uh, coral reef insurance. It was the first ever U.S.-based coral reef insurance policy. Yeah, um, yeah so um, that, that seemed like uh, exciting news. Um, so a question that came in sort of midstream, uh, they said they'd love to hear more about the nonprofit community-based organization insurance pilot you mentioned. Yeah, sure. So um, this is a project funded by the National Science Foundation. It's got a lot of partners working together, um, including us at EBF and our nonprofit partner in New York City, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, as well as um, the Mayor's Office for Climate and Environmental Justice and Guy Carpenter and another disaster recovery group, SVP. Anyway, a whole bunch of partners. And what we are piloting is one of these kind of mesoparametric models that I was talking about, where this nonprofit is going to be purchasing a parametric product actually related to flooding from intense precipitation events. New York City um, has seen growing risk from intense precipitation like this whole region. And last year, there was a couple back-to-back -back, um, really severe rainstorms that just led to really devastating damage and actually loss of life, um, tragically, in New York City. And what the city found was that unlike coastal areas um, of the city, which there's been a lot of education and investment since Hurricane Sandy really called attention to those risks, the folks living in some of the areas subject to these rainfall-related flood risks were often very unaware, had no insurance coverage for it. And so our project is targeting those rainfall-specific events. Um, and I'll say it's been quite a challenge to develop what that parametric trigger looks like because we're one of the first rainfall-related um, products out there. Uh, but the basic idea is the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, I digress, sorry, uh, will get this policy that when there's an intense rainfall event, we'll pay out to them. And they will then use the money to make emergency cash grants to house in need. And so the pilot is really designed to, to cover that delay piece that I think I alluded to, that lots of forms of assistance take too long to get to people. It can be weeks or months, um, sometimes even longer before people get the dollars they need to recover from a disaster event. And more affluent families, that's fine. They can use their savings, they can you know charge their credit card, whatever it is, to kind of tide them over <clears throat> until those resources arrive. But we are finding for lower income households, it's a really really um, harmful situation to have these immediate needs that and no way to meet them, right? Um, and so that's the kind of population that's being targeted with this pilot. Okay, that's fantastic to hear about. And we'd we'll love to follow the progress of this. Oh, we have a, I'll just say there's a website, edf.org backslash inclusive insurance, if anyone wants to look at it more. Um, I'll uh, 
look to find that well, well, during the next question. Um, let's see. There was a question that had come in. Is the livestock program, is it based on parametric insurance? Yes. Yeah. And the trigger here is related to the satellite data. So parametric insurance has really also... Um, really grown because of this growth in data and technology that we have right now. Yeah. And so it uses measurements of drought from satellite data as the trigger. That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Uh, great webinar. Could you comment on whether there's a role for reinsurance in disaster insurance and finance? So reinsurance plays an incredibly important role in disaster insurance. So basically a lot of disaster risk would be uninsurable locally, right? Like you couldn't have, if you were just insuring property in Florida, you would be bankrupt whenever there's like a big storm. And so what insurance companies do is they purchase insurance for themselves, which is reinsurance. And reinsurance allows these types of disaster risks to be diversified globally, to pool them globally so that they're holding some you know, hurricane risk in Florida and some flood risk in Germany and some wildfire risk in Australia. And all these disasters get pooled together. Um, and so primary insurers are able to provide disaster insurance to the extent extent that they can get reinsurance for it. So absolutely, reinsurance is really central and plays an important role here. Um, and reinsurers, uh, you know, are sophisticated analysts of catastrophe risk. And um, as we're seeing in places like Florida, when they're assessing that that risk is just growing up, those prices go up. And that's another driver of higher insurance costs for disasters. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes. Um, a question that came in, um, what hopes do you have for something like the Storm Act or slash revolving loans for states? And how could um, insurance be incorporated into this? Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought specifically about how to incorporate insurance, but I will say that I think it's really critical that we view risk reduction, disaster mitigation, and insurance as complements, like they have to work together. And the reason disaster insurance can get expensive and hard to get is because the risks go up. And the really the only way to solve that, you can subsidize it and pass those risks around and put them on the taxpayer instead. But you can't actually make those costs go away unless you lower the underlying risk. And so to stabilize our insurance markets, we definitely need to invest in risk reduction. Also, there's tons of uninsured costs and going through disasters is really, really hard on families and we don't want them to have to do that. So we need to invest more in, in lowering risks. Um, and so there's a lot of things that need to be done on that front. And part of it is how we get the capital to do that. And loans might be you know, part of that solution. Um, there's a lot more federal dollars going into resilience building in the last couple of years. We've seen huge infusions um, of grants uh, to, invest, to help communities invest in mitigation. And I think there's other roles for insurance to play here too. So for example, one is at the time of rebuilding, wouldn't it be great if your insurance policy gave you a resilience bonus so that you got extra funds if you built back stronger. Um, and that would also be beneficial for your insurance company because you'd have lower claims in the future. Now, insurance companies are a little bit hesitant to just give you a bonus because they think you'll get the bonus from them and then switch companies and they won't kind of benefit from lower claims. So there's a few kinks to work out or you might have to pay for it. But, but in general, I think more thought needs to be put into how we kind of link those things so that you could have money so that, um, cause we know what to do to build stronger, right? Um, you know, like every, you know, for the Institute for Building and Home Safety, for example, has like a fortified standard. And those homes really withstand very strong hurricanes. And so we'd really reduce disaster losses if we built to that standard more. And so can we encourage that, for example, in rebuilding? The trickier question is where is when we're building in places that we really shouldn't be building, right? Where it's just too risky and the cost of continual rebuilding far outweigh, um, you know, the cost of the property or the benefits of being located there. But even there, I think there's a role for insurance to help because we know that there's not enough federal money to buy out everyone who's going to need to relocate from sea level rise and from growing climate risk. And so another tool would be to use private insurance policies so that when you face a complete loss from a disaster like a hurricane or a flood or a wildfire, you can use that money to not rebuild in place but move somewhere safer. And California has really opened that up with some laws and regulations that insurance companies after a wildfire have to pay you the full cost of your claim not to rebuild but for you to take that money and move somewhere else. The problem is it's not tied to a program right now to then put that risky land into open space, which is what we do with federal flood buyouts. 
Um, so instead, other people just move in and then they get damaged and it perpetuates the damage. So we need to couple that type of insurance-based financing with these kind of public sector programs uh, to keep the land out of development. Sorry, that was a long answer for that question. No, that was fascinating. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, yeah. uh, no, that's that's fascinating. Okay, there are a couple of questions about the livestock insurance program that you talked about. First of all, um, is there is there a link to it or can you give me some clues and then I'll find a link? I, I've yeah, actually some things written, have been about, written it years about it years ago. And afterwards I can send you some links if you want to share it with people. But okay. if people Google Kenya Livestock Insurance Program, I'm sure you'll find a bunch of the pages on it. Uh, okay. But if not, I'm happy to send some stuff afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I included that in an article I wrote years ago, so I could probably find it too. Yeah, it's been around um, for a while and I'm surprised that there hasn't been sort of broader replication of that concept because I find it so compelling. And on that subject, one of the questions that came in is, can the livestock program model work in a different context to prevent other types of disasters? Um, do you have ideas around that, how, how something like that could be used? Yeah, it's sort of like the coral reef thing. Like you have to find the right model where that's helpful. And the where this works is when there's some type of intervention ahead of time that would cost money that could really lower losses. Um, and so identifying what those preparedness measures are. Often preparedness measures there are lots you could do that aren't super expensive, like a flood's coming, drive your car to higher ground, right? Um, but it could be used to finance things like temporary flood barriers, you know, to protect communities, households or communities, that type of thing. The, the way that it's been replicated or the concept has kind of expanded um, in more widespread use recently is in something called forecast-based financing, which is using this kind of concept, but not, it's not actually insurance, it's for aid. And so the concern here was that, um, in a lot of cases, international aid after disasters um, came too late, was ill-suited to needs, and again, wasn't doing anything to prevent things. So the Red Cross has really been leading this idea of forecast-based financing, which is when you see this forecast that something really bad is going to happen, like the satellite data showing drought, or there's a forecast of you know a really bad flood event, then the aid is triggered. And so it's like using that same idea of automatic payouts based on some important weather or climate data. Um, but in this case, the, the recipients aren't paying an insurance premium. It's not an insurance product, but the money is then gone. So it's been used in places like I think it was used in Peru ahead of a flood uh, in order to make, because one of the big challenges there apparently after floods was some public health concerns about um, contaminated water. And so they sent out supply. So they used the payout, the, the payout to, for, to provide supplies to um, sanitize water um, to prevent sort of disease outbreaks associated with the flooding. So those types of things. Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry, Sarah, I can't hear you. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Super useful. Have you been involved with or heard of work around influencing insurance reinsurance for the global shipping sector, given the risk of both catastrophic events and their cumulative impacts on the environment and their contributions to global emissions? No, I haven't, but that sounds very interesting. So if whoever asked that has some resources they could share, I'd love to look at them. I know there's been some movement. This is not, not what they're asking, but there's been some um, interest in getting insurers to commit to like pulling back insurance for illegal fishing vessels and stuff like that. And it seems like this might be a place where this idea of underwriting um, restrictions might be useful. I'm just, I don't really know what I'm talking about here. I'm just sharing ideas based on what you just said, um, you know, that you might want to say that we're going to kind of pull back insurance unless certain, um, you know, climate related changes are made. But that sounds really interesting. I'd like to think more about it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the illegal fishing has been around. I included that in the insurance article. So it, it's just, it seems like there's such tremendous potential there uh, yeah. for influencing things. Yeah, to use it more as a lever for, uh, an, or an incentive for behavior change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question, can you provide examples of insurance premiums paid for disaster planning? No, I don't know of insurance paying for planning activities. I don't. Um, it kind of gets to the kind of bigger point, right? That insurance usually is giving you money after something bad happens. <laughs> um, and a lot of the things we've talked about are how to make it, you know, helpful ahead of time. Um, I, I do want to say that I think some of the solutions that we've talked about a little bit, like having an insurance payout, an extra payout for mitigation or to relocate, 
um, or the Kenya example do require planning ahead of time and information and educational resources made available at the time too. So the insurance has to be coupled to those types of activities to be impactful. So to come back to this idea of giving people a bonus to rebuild safer, in the aftermath of a disaster is a terrible time to be trying to convince and educate people. And they don't have bandwidth to be doing research on the best type of roof, right? They're just trying to get their family safe again. And so you need to have that all easy for them and there and available. So it's not just the money, but it's what exactly needs to be done to your home, who can do it that's gonna, that they can trust, that's gonna charge them a fair amount. And that all kind of has to be a package deal. And so because of that, I think, um, and I know we're out of time, but I think a really um, important future avenue for this is how to develop better partnerships between insurance and nonprofits and community groups to have that type of comprehensive uh, response. Okay, thank you so much, Carolyn. And we are out of time, although there's a couple of questions I really wish we had been able to get to. Um, but thank you so much, Carolyn, for your time. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, if this is something we should uh, we should do again um, so we can get to the questions we weren't able to this time, uh, let me know. Just uh, shoot me an email at sarah at octagroup.org and we can look into uh, covering specific areas in more depth. But thank you so much, Karen. We really appreciate you giving the time to do this. And um, I think you all saw the information about the book so you can read up more about insurance and what it can do for the environment. And uh, thank you to everyone who attended. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation again. This was great. Okay. All right. Bye everyone. Take care.